So if I can ask Ritu to firstly introduce herself, the work that she's doing, and also the geographies that she has experience in first off, and then I'll do the same with, with Prashant. Thank you. So I'm Ritu Kumar. Uh, I'm with CDC, which is the UK Government's Development Finance Institute. Um, we are investing mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. We used to invest in other countries, in Latin America and Southeast Asia, but as of 2012, we've, we've sort of focused on, the, on these two continents. I head up our environmental and social unit, and uh, prior to joining CDC, I was at Actis for about seven years, also working on environmental and social aspects. Um, and that's actually where I came across Prashant and all the great work that he's done since in, in uh, progressing this agenda. So maybe what I can do, Matt, is talk a little bit about the, uh, the evolution of the green building space in India, which is a country that I know quite well. What I'd like to do is just give you some idea where I think the genesis of the green building agenda in India has come from and what the pressure points have been there. So I think there are sort of four or five main drivers for how green buildings have evolved in India. And there has been evolution, there has been progress in this space. And it's a combination of a number of factors. Um, so one of them is, of course, the, the sort of growing realization that resources are limited. Uh, you know, in India, as in now we see in Cape Town as well, and some other parts of this continent, that uh, energy and water are truly scarce resources. So, you know, the idea, the, the fact that energy security is an issue, the fact that water stress is a big issue, I think has been uh, uh, an underlying factor in driving this agenda. But that alone is not sufficient, you know. Along with that came the realization that climate change does have its impacts, and, and you know, in these countries, the impacts are quite severe. And this combined with international protocols that you know, it started with the Kyoto Protocol, which now has, has sort of become part of this Paris Agreement, uh, laid down certain um, sort of limitations on greenhouse gas emissions, voluntary ones, at that. But still, it created awareness uh, amongst people and, and institutions. And then there was, in India at the time, I'm talking about, uh, Prashant, correct me if I'm wrong, almost about 10 years ago that these voluntary green building standards became, became quite popular. So it started with LEED in India, and then we had a version of uh, LEED in India called LEED India. Um, and then we had our own Indian um, homegrown green standard called GRIHA, which was developed by uh, an organization called TERI, the Energy and Resources Institute. EDGE hadn't yet uh, come on the scene by then, but I can see that it's now taking over the space. Um, so these, these GRIHA and LEED uh, were sort of fairly popular in India at the uh, some years ago, and they still are. And then there was, in addition to all this, there was an institutional response so the government also became quite active. And the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in India has set standards for energy efficiency for commercial and industrial buildings. And that has also driven the agenda a fair amount of. I think in the previous, one of the previous sessions, one of the points made by the panelists was that, you know, government regulation needs to be in place to work alongside any private players to actually change the shape of the market. So that has happened in India to, to a fairly large extent. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, there has been, you know, the Green Building Councils have been set up, but they're being set up here as well in Kenya, in Ghana, I think Uganda, a couple of other countries, am I right? I put, uh, as I understand, it's SSA, probably Kenya is the most yeah. formed, isn't it? Uh, Muddy, do you want to? Yeah, there's seven Green Building Councils, actually eight now, Green eight. Building Councils in Africa. That's right. Nigeria and Uganda are setting up, even countries like Botswana and so on yeah. are getting... Uh, yeah. So I think th th those are also really sort of important developments in spreading the, the message. Um, the response of investors is a more recent phenomenon, I should say. Uh, and that could be because, you know, traditionally it has been 
um, so the perception has been that this, uh, this adds to costs, you know, green buildings are more costly. And maybe that's what led to investors being a bit hesitant. But I think now, as we've also heard uh, in the course of the day, uh, investors are beginning to respond. For sure, uh, investors like ourselves and Actis and IFC and a lot of the pension funds are, are very keen on this agenda, pushing the agenda quite a bit. Um, so I think that is really, really important. And I'll leave uh, Prashant to talk about what IFC have done and you know the, the emergence of EDGE. But maybe I can just tell you a little bit about what CDC has been doing, per se. So we have actually signed an MOU with, uh, with IFC that we will uh, encourage all our real estate developments to get certified to EDGE. And we're trying to do this in a serious manner. Uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a requirement. So we have to work together with the investee company, with the portfolio company, to uh, encourage them to do that. And I was really uh, pleased to hear ALP today uh, announce that they will, they will get certified to EDGE. Um, ALP, we, we are co-investors with IFC and ALP. So that's been great. Um, in India, uh, a couple of our hospital investments are on the verge of getting certification, full certification design, uh, construction stage certification. And I think hospitals being large consumers of energy, large, you know, uh, having very big utility bills, for them it, it's a no-brainer, and I'm, we're finding that to be the case. Uh, so that's a really positive uh, um, uh, um, pro um, uh, thing for us. Um, we have just invested in a hotel chain in Africa, uh, which are also going to be setting up hotels in Eastern Africa, but they are based out of uh, Morocco. And we have had two days of workshop two weeks ago with them on edge, getting them to understand what it means, getting them on board, and I, I can say quite confidently that they will do it. Uh, so that's, again, you know, very, very encouraging. Um, we have an investment, quite a sort of neat uh, um, little investment in Malawi, where we have invested alongside Lafarge Holsim uh, in a company that we call 14 Trees, the name of the company is 14 Trees. Um, it is the company, the, the purpose of that, com the, what they're doing is building soil stabilized bricks. So low carbon embodied bricks to replace the normal concrete bricks. So I think that would uh, be really uh, important to again move the edge agenda forward so that we are using more sustainable material. We're trying to work together with IFC to see whether we can, you know, uh, you when we use these bricks for, let's say, schools or affordable homes, if we could get that spec certified to edge, so that once, you know, if you roll it out in that same, and you have follow exactly the same specs, you can keep getting, it's at, you know, every home to get certified to edge, because this is, would be for individual homes, as I understand. So, but this is a conversation we are having. Fantastic. But I think it's, uh, sorry. No, I was just saying, really fantastic. The, um, so the steps that you see as being really important as to the, in Asia, in India, that you've seen through this is, first of all, an awareness, a, 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 a pain, water stress was one of the first yeah. things. Um, so actually people had fear uh, coming into the marketplace and then a continued form of awareness, uh, both, um, it sounds sort of through climate change, sort of propaganda or whatever you want to call it, but certainly information coming into the market, then um, some protocols being in place and then government yeah. picking up on that. Is, is, is that. And then the investors. And then the investors sort of seeing the so value. No, not in necessarily in so, that order, though. So we're working, looking at this <laughs> a little bit backwards. Is, I mean, your experience, Prashant, is this similar to the markets that you've worked in? or And is that happening, do you think, now in Africa? Where are we down that journey? And Matt, uh, you, is your question, sorry, uh, you know, is your question about the finances role or is it going to be broadly what's happening in the market? I think uh, it's broadly. I think okay. the, 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 right. this session, I w right. I'd really want to sort of understand whether or not we can what take can you copy from copy others? Or, Great. or, or okay. where we are in the right. journey right. as well. That's fascinating, actually, because, you know, if <laughs> I, I find like, you know, because we are now involved in, in about 14 
kind of countries with deeper programs, one way or the other, kind of working on, on, on various instruments to make that happen, right? So, and, 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 and just broadly speaking, uh, as Rita mentioned, we, we work like CDC offering finance ourselves to directly to developers and you know hotel chains and that sort of thing, but also property funds that sort yeah. of helps, helps to scale things up with banks and so on, right? But also we work with governments. A lot of times we help in supporting a code development uh, as well as looking at incentives and what can they do from their yeah. end. And, and finally, the aid certification. But that's our strategy. And, and what we find is that you know, there's no kind of, there's no um, rocket science to this in the sense that you really, it's difficult to predict what would work, but yeah. the broad themes, it seems to me. So for us, the really successful places, I would say, is, uh, you know, that's really gone. I mean, just to give you a sense, from stop to start, in two years of introduction of the program, 7% of all construction in Vietnam is certified edge. That's like, I even, you know, and no, no one knows why. We have not made a single investment there. It had nothing to do with the investment. Just was the right thing at the right time. You know, either that or, or something to do with the communist sort of system that sort of likes something Western, you know, something appealed there and it, it got worked. through immediately. It got through. So that really is one case study. On the other side, if you look at Mexico, you know, that was also, you know, that was a, a bank. That was an interesting one. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a general kind of interest in the banking sector here. So that's yeah. maybe another one to kind of look at, which is uh, Infonavit, which is a bank which offers 60% of all mortgages in, in Mexico. Uh, mostly in the affordable housing sector, but, but kind of a, a broad uh, ban. They tested out the market about five years ago with a green mortgage product. Basically, you know, you have to do a few things, you know, a few usual things, including solar hot water systems. So it was kind of visible from outside. And they would give a small subsidy, depending on your economic strata, okay. right? And initially, there was a hesitation. Maybe they did 1,000 homes out of the 60% of the market. But then people started to pull it. It pulled so hard so that, that was people pushed. That was people pulling, actually. Right, yeah, people pulling. <laughs> people, yeah. Yeah. developers yeah. were selling those properties faster. So they yeah. were asked to, you know, there was an auction. So they just offered a few projects initially. But they, then developers only started producing uh, products that suited that, uh, that product that the bank was offering. Yeah. So the bank had to change its drop strategy, drop the green part. It was mortgages. So all mortgages had to meet that criteria now. So yeah. There's nothing green about it. So it's, it's interesting, and how that shows also how a bottom-up can work. Yeah. Uh, you know, sort of a grassroots one, right? Uh, and South Africa is an example also where a single-handedly, you know, one fund can change. So I think there's a lot of interesting kind of processes. Well, that, that's in, one of yeah. the things that I think you know um, we, maybe we're meant to look south to. South Africa, because they've they've started this process, right. but for similarity between the two markets, they don't seem to necessarily marry no. the problems and the challenges. I think Mexico is closer to South Africa, so yeah, highly okay. evolved, you know, housing market, and a typical developer builds fifty thousand units a year. One developer, and they're yeah. not even the biggest. So, it's sort of just to give you a sense of scale, they have really automated construction in a scary way. So that, that's another thing to worry about. But yeah. so South Africa is in that sort of spectrum, maybe not at that scale. Uh, but I think the closer one, I would say, is Asia uh, to, to Kenya, actually. Yeah. You know, sort of the, the Indias and even, even the, the sort of Indonesia, where, you know, government processes can be quite tricky, but private sector is very dynamic. They're smaller, they have to make do, and they're creative. I think that's, that's a great space to be. And then the mortgage market, it's evolving. I know the interest rates are huge here, but there may be a way that, that can be brought into this. That could be a way to do it. Well, already our time is up, but I'm going to ask Riti <laughs> then. So in that journey from India, um, uh, where are we in comparison to where Sub-Saharan Africa is now? So where is India now? Um, how long did it take to sort of get to that sort of position? Well, I think it's a, a evolution. So I would say, you know, it's been sort of even 15 years ago is okay. when I really started looking at this space in India. And I wouldn't say that India is now, you know, top of the league, uh, because it's still, uh, no. there's a still a lo lot to be done. And as, as Prashant says, you know, the, the, the sort of government system there is also not as nimble. Uh, but having, but there is, but this... With, well, that's okay. This, you know, I think that's yeah. fine, because why compare yourself to something that you're never going to, you know, I'd rather yeah. Yeah. people yeah. in the room to be saying, actually, these are what, what we've seen happen and this right. is the sort of t the yeah. steps that have happened. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think that, you know, there, there needs to be a confluence of different pr pr yeah. pressures. 
Because just one thing on its own can't do it. Okay. So, you know, the private sector has to play its part. The government has to come in with the right incentives. Um, and then, you know, the financial community and investors. Right, and also when you look at the urban growth rate, yeah. you know, Kenya is behaving more like an Asia is, right, in terms of the growth of urbanization, and, and it's in that stage of process, where South Africa has kind of had that development curve. Maybe it's filling up some housing stock right now, so it's sort of a different space. And I think, you know, that, that housing is a huge opportunity yes. as well for DFIs, for banks, and I think, if you can tap in that, you know, I think it's not going to last forever, right? So this is this is the problem with the thinking. They think this is, uh, you know, this is a, this will go on for for a long while. But maybe 20, 30 years, and then the population may stabilize, and, yeah. and urbanization will also would, would, would kind of stabilize too. But so wow, what a, are 20, 30 years? So in, right. But it's a small know. window when you think about, you know, how quickly things are being yeah. built, and then yeah. it'll be finished by the time, you know. Right. Yeah. Are there any comments from the audience uh, about this topic? Or are we good? Because it's one, it's one which I think really defines, you know, it's, it's good to benchmark. I really do think, you know, and, and um, I, I wonder where, we, where Africa, where Sub-Saharan Africa really benchmarks themselves. So this is really fascinating stuff because I think that these are key markets that are, have put in place some serious sort of moves towards this. And, and if we can try and mirror that and understand the time frames and the challenges that were faced as well. Right. I think the only sort of big so what for me is, is unless you have some projects on the ground, everything, it all looks like everything is feasible. From a lot of people I've seen, they get in that state of everything is working, but nothing really on the ground. And we've also yeah. seen that ourselves in our own kind of projects. So just starting with a few early adopters, making them happy is critical in this space, I, yeah. I, I feel, because they would be the champions, you know, like CDC. You know, working with them initially, right? I remember actually the Garden City project. We worked on that together. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. And, and maybe this is something that we should continue to start digging into um, as we go forward. But thank you. Thanks very much for joining us.